All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar titled, Are You Really Compliant? What No One Tells You About ELD versus AOBRD. My name is Brittany Wooten, Community Manager for eROAD. I will be facilitating the webinar this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We've received an influx of questions regarding the ELD mandate over the last few months, so we hope you find the information valuable and timely. Before we begin, I'm going to go over a few ground rules, but first, I'd love for you all to participate in our poll. Take a look at your screen for the question. We'd like to understand a little bit more about where everyone's at on their journey to ELD. While you fill that out, we'll go over a few housekeeping items for today's session. If you have any technical difficulties or issues with the audio, please let us know right away by IMing us in the chat box. We will also have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, so if you have any questions while you're listening in, feel free to submit them in the question box and we'll get to them at the end. In addition, the slides will be emailed to you after our session. Now to introduce today's webinar experts, we have Suna Lee, EROAD's Regulatory Compliance Manager. She is responsible for understanding the regulations and policies that you and I both work within every day and translate those to make sure our products meet every technical requirement. We also have Susan Rosinski, Sales Engineer for EROAD. Susan brings knowledge from both carrier and driver perspectives and we like to call her the bridge between customers and product. With that, I will pass it over to Susan and Suna. Hi, good morning, everybody. Good uh, morning. My name is Suna, and I'm with Susan today. Um, we'll just take a few more moments with the poll um, before we close it. It's interesting to see um, the results that are coming in. So we'll go and close that for now. All right. Thank you, everyone. So it's interesting right now, um, we're seeing a result where we see 72% of participants using paper, 17% using ELD, 6% on AOBRD, and 6% on exempt or I don't know. So that's a really strong indicator that you know many of you are still considering um, the decision to an ELD, um, and you are considering what the differences are between the, the different technologies that are there. So, um, you know, we've heard many of our customers say that they've been confused and unable to tell the difference between the products out there in the market, and especially telling the difference between AOBRDs and ELDs. In fact, you know, Susan and I were just in Orlando, Florida last week with the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance at the North American Inspector Championships and NACE um, to train the top inspectors on our ELD and you know, like the carriers, these inspectors are actually preparing for the compliance state and training on the ELDs to learn the differences between AOBRDs and ELDs. Our impressions and takeaway is that this mandate is happening and FMCSA enforcement and the community are getting ready for that compliance state. So let's begin um, with this presentation. Hopefully by the end, uh, the goal is to make sure that you understand um, and are knowledgeable about the differences between ELDs and AOBRDs, and hopefully Suna can uh, get you started on that, and by the end, you'll have a better place in which to make your decision from. Right, and so we'll be tackling um, that key difference between ELDs and uh, AOBRDs and explaining what those uh, mean and why they're so important for your operations. We'll tackle what grandfathered in really means. Uh, we know that if you have an AOBRD in a vehicle, you'll get two additional years to adopt an ELD. And so is this thing really good for you or is it not? And what are some of the caveats around this uh, decision and, you know, what's not really explicitly clear? Um, and so what kind of questions should you be asking? Susan and I have worked really closely with many of our customers through this tr transition to our ELD, and we've summarized a couple of um, key tips for you to prepare for this compliance with the ELD mandate. So ultimately, Susan and my goal today with this webinar is to ensure that you gain this full understanding about the differences between ELDs and AOBRDs so you can be confident about the decisions that you make, um, because knowledge is power and we want to equip you with that. So. Without uh, further ado, let's turn to look at some of the differences between ELDs and AOBRDs and why they are so important. So just to give you a brief regulatory overview um, of the differences um, and what 
arose with the ELD mandate. So with AOBRDs, the regulations were put in place in 1988. It is specified in Title 49, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 395, or the Section 395.15. It's not a very long uh, provision, and it provides a very broad brush of what needs to be captured and presented for the driver and the enforcement. Clearly, there's been a lot of technical advancements uh, between now and, well, from nine, the late 1980s, so it's quite necessary for the regulations to keep up with the times. The ELD final rule, which outlines the mandate for the use of ELDs by interstate drivers, was published in December of 2015. It sets out in very extensive detail the technical and functional requirements for an ELD in the same Title 49 Code of Federal Regulations Part 395 but in a whole new uh, eight appendix, subpart B was added. And uh, ELD must be able to satisfy all the requirements that are outlined in that. So let's go through some of the major areas and compare between the AOBRD and ELD requirements. First off, the roadside inspections. With AOBRDs, roadside inspections had varied processes and outcomes due to the lack of standardization across the devices and limited or minimal information to the enforcement officials. For example, it did not really require a graph grid to be mandatory on AOBRDs, but only required a list of duty status changes. The ELD mandate sought to standardize the recording and ensure consistent method for the roadside inspections. Firstly, the ELD must have the capability to transfer the ELD data output files via either of these two options. One is the telematics option, which means it needs to transfer via the web services and email. And two, it's the local transfer options, which means USB or Bluetooth. As an ELD provider, they must choose one of these two transfer methods, whereas a state enforcement agency will choose one method from the telematics option and one from the local option. So all systems must have a fallback option as well in case this tra data transfer process does not work. And as backup options, an ELD must be able to present the driver's log information by either a display or a printout um, that's away from the vehicle. So let me quote a provision here, uh, specifically outlined in section 4.8.1.2b. It states that an ELD must be designed so that its display may be reasonably viewed by an authorized safety official without entering the commercial motor vehicle. For example, the display may be untethered from its mount or connected in a manner that would allow it to be passed outside the vehicle for a reasonable distance. So what does this really mean? In order to meet these requirements, an AOBRD will most certainly require a software update but it may also require a hardware upgrade, which includes different cable connections or any work to be done in conjunction with a printer um, so that the hardware, it, it may need to be replaced if it does not have those options available right now. So Suna, can you kind of give the audience a, a little definition? What's, what's the difference between software and hardware? Yeah, um, I'll go into it more detail at the, in uh, another section in this presentation. But a hardware upgrade, it means, you know, there is a difference in the hardware, so a different connector is required or there needs to be um, some sort of a different uh, interface that needs to be there um, and it needs to be either swapped out or replaced, whereas a software upgrade, it may mean it's an over-the-air or a USB type of upgrade to the software. Um, it may mean a different interface for the driver and the enforcement official. So, We'll go into that in more detail in the presentation. But the key point here with this section is that, you know, the difference between AOBRD and ELD is that the standardized process requires some attention to understand what that device is capable of doing. So, okay, moving to the next section here. In terms of malfunctions in data diagnostics, the, there was a rationale behind ELDs, um, which was to reduce falsifications around driving time and ensure more accurate hours of service information to be captured. So this integrity of the data from the ELD depends actually on the capability of the device to be able to monitor and diagnose any malfunctions and tampering events. 
Where a device is tampered with, such as when the power is removed or the location is not able to be retrieved because the device is um, not covered up or it's not in a place where GPS can be retrieved, or the connection to the engine is disconnected or jammed, um, these types of uh, issues um, can affect the data and uh, cause the integrity of that data to be um, uh, uh, looked at in more detail. So the AOBRDs were required to be tamper-proof and have the ability to identify these sensors, but it was left to the AOBRD provider to determine how these were to be captured. However, in terms of the ELDs, um, all of the different malfunctions and data diagnostics events are extensively outlined. And how an ELD monitors and detects and records that is specifically determined out and outlined in this uh, subpart B. So it's important to understand this as a carrier because under the ELD mandate in section 395.34, it places that responsibility on the carrier to fix and resolve these malfunctions within eight days. So given this short time frame, it's important to ensure that the drivers and your support staff really understand and how to identify and resolve any of these malfunctions that can arise with an ELD. Location is another area where there's major differences between AOBRDs and ELDs. The frequency, which means how often the location is captured, and the accuracy or the provision, which means how close it is to the actual location, are specified clearly for an ELD, whereas it wasn't so much for the AOBRDs. ELDs can protect the driver's privacy a lot more with, uh, in compared to the AOBRD. Specifically, when the driver is operating under com personal conveyance, such as when they're driving their tractor home, the ELD must only capture the location at the beginning and at the end with reduced precision, which is to a 10-mile radius rather than a 1-mile ride radius if the driver was driving in driving status. Further, the way that the location information is displayed on an ELD for roadside inspection is it shows a, the distance and the direction to a nearby city, town, village of a state with population size of more than 5,000. This means that if the driver is driving through remote areas, when the then the location will show a geoconversion that may be far to a faraway city or town. This is quite different to what is shown on an AOBRD. So it's important for you to um, operationally um, look at if you are using the location information for other things such as IFTA, IRP, or for weight distance taxes, um, that the frequency and the accuracy of the location recordings may be different um, for those purposes. So, you know, for example, state line crossings, the types of roads that you're traveling on may be required to be able to calculate accurately the taxable and non-taxable miles and by jurisdictions which are required at a minimum, but these may not be provided under an ELD. So Susan, have you heard any of these types of things coming up from carriers um, as to what they use the location for and how these differences can um, be challenging operationally? They are challenging because on a paper log, the drivers are just used to, you know, the, the nearest city and state, uh, you know, they're used to just writing down that in the remark section, the location. And so the locations that the ELD is picking up for the mandate, you know, um, they might be in Portland, but it might be picking, or near Portland, but it might be picking up, you know, the closest location, which would be another city, because it's super, super accurate. So the drivers, um, and I would, uh, you know, suggest that uh, the location part here with the ELD is included in your training. So make sure that the drivers know that it's not an issue with the ELD, um, but it's actually a change for what's required for location to be put down. Um, and also the tax, the tax has to be more accurate, but with some systems they don't have that accuracy. But just note that there's a difference between which platform you're using if you're using an ELD to collect tax information, the locations are going to be different than what's required for the ELD. And I'm not sure, Suna, with the AOBRD, like you said, um, the locations, they can be automatic or manual, so that's not even um, something that, that you're sure it's going to be accurate or not. That's right. Okay. So in relation, uh, related to that, um, the automatic driving status. This requirement definitely highlights how the regulations have caught up with the technology capability right now. 
AOBRDs did not require the driving status to be captured automatically, whereas with the ELDs, it must be automatically record, uh, must be a or able to automatically record the driving status once the vehicle reaches five miles per hour. Unless the driver selects yard move or personal conveyance, it, then it would be captured as on-duty yard move or off-duty personal conveyance. Um, but other than that, at five miles per hour, unless you uh, unless you select those two different special driving categories, it will automatically change to driving. So we've heard a lot of carriers that have experienced using AOBRDs that have actually told us that um, some AOBRDs right now capture driving automatically at different speeds. So at 10 miles per hour or 15 miles per hour, can you tell us a little bit about what that really means operationally for a carrier um, in, their, in their transition if they have to face that? Right, so, so we all know how much a challenge training is. So if a driver, or you have drivers that are have been using a legacy system like an AOBRD, uh, or if they're uh, used to using some type of telematics and they're not used to that driving restriction of five miles an hour, it is quite a change for them. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is to let them know that the ELD mandate sets that five miles an hour. So the ELD provider, we get that a lot that, you know, we should set it for higher because the other systems they're used to using are set at a higher mm -hmm. uh, uh, mile per hour. So let them know that it is an, a requirement per federal motor carrier that five miles an hour, that's not changeable. That's not something we can change. And then they need to be able to understand that that's the way that it's going to be. So how they're going to be driving and, and to anticipate when they're going to be using those special driving categories because it is a challenge to go from 12 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour down to five. Absolutely. So make sure that they know that and that's a requirement and that um, help them to transition to that, that lower speed because it is, it's been a challenge for drivers. Mm -hmm. Yes, and especially when you have, you know, drivers that are sitting in a particular brake location and they've been asked to move, um, if they, you know, go and exceed that five miles per hour, their brake may be affected by that. So, you know, making sure that the drivers are parked in a particular location is also quite important. So, knowing this early and um, building that kind of training um, for the drivers to get used to this particular requirement may be something you need to consider. Yes, and good news is that... Uh, Drivers are very, very um, adaptable, so they find a way. So as long as they know ahead of time and you kind of help them with that, they find a way to adapt and, and they've been making it work. Okay. Another driver-centric uh, aspect of the mandate. So the ELD mandate makes it clear, based on all the legal challenges it's faced over the years, that the, uh, EL the driver's logs actually belong to the driver. So it's made it clear with the ELDs that the driver actually must have the ability to review, edit, and annotate the records at all times. A carrier may suggest an edit, but it's upon the driver who reserves the right to accept or reject that edit. A few other criteria around editing on ELDs are that driving time cannot be shortened or removed, and all edits must be accompanied by an explanation on the remarks section. Um, Operationally, this means that if you are used to an AOBR, AOBRD that allowed the carrier to have the final edit rights, then it might mean adjusting to some changes here. It will require working with your drivers to ensure good practice of reviewing frequently and ensuring that the logs are up to date to stay compliant. And to check any pending edits that you may provide and suggest, but it's ultimately upon the driver to make sure that they accept or reject those changes. So. Special driving categories around yard move and personal conveyance. Now, these are finally sort uh, accommodated for within the ELD mandates. It's uh, clearly set out that these must be used a particular manner as well. So the the carrier actually uh, must set up the drivers on the ELD support system and control the permissions for using the yard move or personal conveyance statuses. You may allow yard move and personal conveyance, or none at all, either. The drivers, when using these statuses, must ensure that they select before they drive in order for the status to apply and deselect them before they leave the vehicle and change the duty statuses. So, uh, Susan, you and I have worked with several of our customers in terms of training the drivers around yard move, which is a huge area where there's been a lot of training we've given. Um, do you want to explain why it's so beneficial to work with them early around this yard move particularly? Yes. Well, you're used to the 
on duty, off duty, sleeper birth, the drive categories, but they're not used to really thinking about on duty, all of the different areas that it could be. So what is a yard? So updating your company policy on when they can use it would be good, letting them know that. Um, so it takes the guesswork out of it. Um, and then when they can use it, when they can't use it. Um, making sure that they're uh, initiating that and if they don't do it properly that they know how to make remarks and annotations um, so that uh, you know roadside inspectors can can look and do their job and make sure that everything's being accurate and that you're in compliance um, the, the drivers are having a difficult time uh, understanding that when they're in yard moves uh, that as soon as the vehicle goes into an off ignition status that they're not driving anymore that it'll kick them out and that when they move the vehicle again they have to hit yard moves again so we'll get into this a little bit more in the presentation but on uh, the back office training for support staff and for your safety folks and dispatchers it's important for them to understand yard moves and personal conveyance as well so that when the drivers do have issues they have support on you know how to use that but ahead of time soon and just what you said the more people that know about it the more people that understand the yard moves and especially the personal conveyance the more your company policies can back you up the better off and more successful you'll be and then we all know that uh, successful happy drivers stay with the company and so that's all important right now with um, drivers uh, shortage going on that's right okay uh, in terms of certification and registration, so ALBRDs and ELDs actually both require self-certification against their respective requirements. But the key difference with the ELD is that the ELD provider actually must register the product with FMCSA on the public registry, which everybody can actually go and check. So I went on there yesterday, um, and when I checked, there were 93 different ELDs that are registered on that website. It's a lot. So be aware that given that it's a self-certification, that FMCSA does not actually approve um, or check that any of the check against the, in, the criteria for the ELDs for any of these devices. But just so that you understand that the, what the what's actually involved for an ELD provider and in terms of the registration, um, let's kind of go through what a provider must be able to demonstrate um, in terms of when they register with FMCSA. So they have to be able to have an ELD user manual outlining how a driver can operate an ELD. They must provide an explanation of the internal testing procedures to validate that the ELD satisfies all the functional requirements outlined in the mandate. Uh, the provider must list all the malfunctions and data diagnostics that can arise on the ELD and how they can be resolved. There must also be an instructional guidance document that outlines the step-by-step -step process for the roadside inspection as well. These are actually just the minimum requirements and steps the ELD providers must undertake. So what other ways can a provider give you the assurance um, that they meet the requirements and, give you, um, and make sure that you are staying compliant past that compliance date? For example, in Everd's case, uh, we've elected to take an extra step uh, we've done an independent third-party unbiased verification with uh, PIT Group, which uh, involved a bench testing and a live operational testing with the motor carrier to generate uh, likely scenarios and go through a lot of those test procedures that have been outlined by FMCSA and go through the mandate requirements to test that we meet all of those requirements. So ask those ELD providers questions about what they did for the registration and what they've done to test for compliance against that ELD mandate because ultimately the responsibility is actually on you as the carrier um, that, are, that are providing these to your drivers to make sure that they meet all of those requirements come December 18th of 2017. So, so Suna, is there a place that um, carriers and folks listening, is there a place they could go to see um, which of the ELD providers have gone through the steps that EROAD's gone for third-party certification? Uh, the key way to check for this is to see, you know, a lot of the user manuals and the, and the images that have been uploaded with the public registry can indicate whether they have done independent third-party verification. So you can check it that way. In terms of the registry itself, there's no other fields that are available for third-party verification, but it's some it's an additional step that is voluntary for the carriers, uh, sorry, for the ELD vendors to go through. So check their collateral um, to to make sure that you know what other steps have they done to be able to make sure that 
um, it gives you that assurance, level of assurance around that pr product. Okay. So, turning over to what does AOBRD grandfathering really mean for you? We know that if you've got an AO, if you install an AOBRD in your vehicle before December 18th, 2017, you'll be able to get an ex extra two years to transition to an ELD. This means um, you will have an up till the December 16th of 2019 to change over from an AOBRD to ELDs. But really, if MCSA meant for this provision to be a way to give extra time for the carriers to carefully plan and transition to the ELDs, they appreciated that it takes a lot of time and effort. It wasn't really to give you know, time for a carrier to select an AOBRD you know, leading up to December the 18th of this year to find an AOBRD and then uh, go to an ELD after that. So think carefully and understand what having an AOBRD past December 18th of this year will mean for you and your operations. So let's go through what that means operationally. So this question, what if you are intending on growing your operations? What does that grandfathering really mean for you? FMCSA actually provided a clarification in February that if you're using an AOBRD and you replace a vehicle with another one, you can install the same existing AOBRD to that new vehicle. So let's say you have 50 vehicles, you sell one and then you get that one replaced with another one. That AOBRD that you had installed in the old vehicle can be put into your new vehicle even after December 18th of, the, of t this year. However, if you do increase your fleet and let's say you add new vehicles after December 18th, 2017, it means that you will require ELDs for those new vehicles that you add. So this grandfathering clause, is, it means that it's done on a per vehicle basis rather than on a fleet or a carrier basis. So just because you have AOBRDs or select to have AOBRDs in your fleet, um, does not mean that you can continue to have AOBRDs um, until 2000, December 2019 for your entire fleet. So operationally, you may be impacted by having to manage multiple backend systems, um, one for AOBRDs and one for ELDs past December of this year. It means additional administration and compliance processes and costs if you do decide to go down that route. So make sure that you understand what this real grandfathering can mean for you given what plans you have for your operations going forward. So Susan, you know, can you see any other operational challenges that carriers should be aware of? Um, you know, we, I've heard from one of the uh, carriers that if they have drivers that switch vehicles and they select to have AOBRDs, it may be a problem. Can you go into more detail on that one? Well, again, going back to the training issue. So, and as soon as laid out, there are some main major differences between AOBRDs and ELDs, especially the, the five mile per hour. So if you have drivers that are switching back and forth between vehicles, one might have an AOBRD, one might have an ELD, might be the same system, might be different systems, um, learning different systems, being trained on different systems, learning the different requirements per the AOBRD, learning the different requirements for the ELD. Switching back and forth could be a compliance nightmare. And it might not be something that the drivers you know, are up for. They're, they're busy driving. They've got lots of stuff to do. So that's quite a burden mm -hmm. um, to place on the drivers. And I want to mention another thing. So Federal Motor Carrier initially, when they gave this extra two years, it wasn't meant for like the last minute land grab up to December. So you've got another two years. It was put in place for those legacy systems that have been out there giving those companies the opportunity to update their software and their hardware and giving the, you know, usually the larger companies um, that use AOBRDs, giving them the opportunity to switch out, you know, thousands of their vehicles, which takes extra time. So it, it, the rules, the rules are set. Everything's changing. So the the rules are changing to ELD. They're they're out there. So the AOBRD regulations are are going away. You know, they're not going to be there. So just understand that, um, you know, if if you're getting an AOBRD at the last minute. There's going to be multiple operational and training challenges that you're going to have that eventually, you know, the AOBRDs are, are they're going away. So just think about your drivers and think about operations. What, what extra challenges that will place and extra burden and, and who that's going to fall on. Okay, so if your AOBRD needs to be upgraded, 
Um, if, uh, and there, this is what we were talking about earlier in terms of, you know, what, what the differences between an AOBRD and an ELD involves. And it may involve a software upgrade, it may mean a hardware upgrade, or even both. And so, like, like we described earlier, a software upgrade is when you have uh, the device that's um, updated either over the air or with a new um, application that's through a USB port. And that actually um, will show a different interface for the driver and a different interaction. In terms of a hardware upgrade, it could mean new cables or new wiring could be had, um, or it may mean a swap out with a different hardware that meets different requirements. So if it, whichever situations you may fall under, which will be required for an AOBRD to be upgraded to an ELD, then there will be new learnings for the drivers um, based on those different interfaces. Um, and uh, there may need to be new practices for those drivers um, using the new software. And also, um, you may need to be aware if there is a swap out involved and there may be additional costs related to those new cables or new devices that you may need to install. So just be aware that um, you know, with an AOBRD, going to an ELD may require some sort of an upgrade. So, Susan, um, what are some of those tips to be able to prepare for the compliance with the ELD mandate going forward? Okay, so like Suna said, we've, we've been out in the marketplace quite a bit, and we work with carriers and drivers um, for multiple reasons. You know, the drivers are the ones that are using the device, and we also work with enforcement officers as well. They're the ones that are going to be roadside using the device. So we've heard a lot of feedback, and so this section of our presentation is, is to provide that feedback to you so it can help you with your onboarding and with your strategizing for going through this trying time. So one of the things is make sure that you're understanding the device that, you're, that you've chosen to use. So whether it's a BYOD, which is a bring your own device, uh, whether Bluetooth connection, if, if your drivers are going to need to use a tablet or a phone or some other type of device that's alongside the ELD, making sure they understand it and that your back office staff understands that for when issues arise because it is technology, there will be um, issues that arise. So understanding the device or devices is very, very important. If you're looking through the user manual and if it's so confusing you can't even figure it out, uh, the drivers need to figure that out too. So make sure that the level of technology of the device that you're choosing matches matches your qualifications or your abilities. Um, weigh the impacts on your operations for, for what you're going to be choosing. Um, if you need the dispatching, if you need uh, routing, if you need all of those different types of things, great. Look for a more challenging uh, technology. But if you need something simple or if you want something simple, you don't have to get something that you know can has multiple buttons and multiple different things. So understanding the device, weighing those impacts, understanding your operations, actually sooner are finding out that um, a lot of the companies that haven't used technology before, mm -hmm. they're having to really look at their operations, you know, mm -hmm. how their drivers are paid, you know, what they're doing, because, you know, the update in technology means an update kind of to maybe some of your operational procedures as well. Mm -hmm. um, timing. So get a plan. It, it's four months to go time here, so we're running out of time. So clearly outline um, how much time things are going to take. Uh, your um, installations. You know, the time that the trucks are going to be off the road, where they are. So phases of implementation. Do we want to do all of this at once? Do we want to train the drivers all at once? Do we want to install at once? Do we want to have, you know, time in between? And what that's going to look like. Who's going to do it? This is very important. You know, getting everything uh, delivered and then trying to figure out last minute who's going to do what and when. You know, it's, it's the middle of August right now. The holidays are coming up. So that's, you know, Thanksgiving time and, and all of that that goes on. So when you're going to be open and when that's going to get done. And so setting up the plan pre, you get the devices, during installs and all that, and then afterwards is very, very important to, to get that all figured out. Write it down, have a couple meetings, and then uh, have a go at it. But just kind of, if you're planning on it all just falling into place, we haven't seen that as a successful strategy at this point. So number two, so take it for a test drive. Now, like we just said with time, it is August. 
So the try before you buy doing a pilot, you, you've kind of missed the boat with the 60 to 90 day pilot trial period phases. There's already a lot of companies out there that are backlogged to November. So if you are going to pilot at this time, which I suggest it's a great idea, you're going to be a, to a two week, 30 day period now so that you have the time for installs, training, implementation, all that. So try before you buy it, that's great, but get a move on that now if you're wanting to do that and the time that you're going to have for that is going to be shorter than it was because it is so short and close time period to December here. Um, not all ELDs are the same, like we said before. Some of them can, you know, do all different types of things and some of them are just very basic. They're just calculating and collecting that information for your hours of service. So make sure you understand your operations, make sure you understand what you need, and make sure that you understand that there's different costs associated with just a simple uh, all in-cab device like eRoads, or if you're going to do a BYOD plug and play that requires data plans and other things. So there's a cost involved with different types of ELDs that are just, it, it's not a basic, this is the cost and this is the monthly fee. If there are other components needed for the ELD to be a compliant ELD, sometimes there's a cost associated with that. So make sure you understand that. So all of these things we've gone over, ease of use, best way to test that is put it on your drivers. Have, have a driver user for a couple days and see, see what they think. Look at the accuracy of the records. So you're going to want to make sure you have some time period to review your paper logs alongside the, uh, the new ELD that you're using to make sure of the accuracy, the reliability of the system. You want to make sure that you know the locations that you're going, it's going to be able to pick up those locations properly and it's going to work. Um, some systems that we've heard out there have a 40% fail rate. So that's kind of that's kind of high. So make sure that you're that you're checking on the reliability of the units as well. And then make sure that it's meeting your operations. Again, if it can do a bunch of things that you're not doing, it's not going to be very helpful for you. Um, but if it does, that might be something that can help you uh, get a good ROI out of your unit. So number three here, our favorite thing, updating those company policies. So with an ELD, with electronic logs, uh, it's not the same as a paper log. So updating your hours of service and, and logging policies, it's time. Um, training requirements. Uh, as we know, we love getting audited, and the auditors love to see, you know, who's been trained, how many times they've been trained, you know, looking at your training record. Um, they're going to look to see who's been trained for your ELDs and who's been trained in the back office to audit those. And, and uh, so it's a good time to go over those policies and make sure that you've got a robust and a practical uh, training schedule and that you've got that written down that you're following that. And training with the ELDs is going to make you and your drivers more successful. So make sure you define your outline, your criteria and restrictions for the use of those special driving categories, which as soon as said, that's the personal conveyance and yard moves. Um, personal conveyance uh, definition or rules per federal motor carrier have not changed, but how they're implemented, how they're used has been changed. So let your drivers know when they can use it, um, when they can't use it, who can use it, and you might not allow it at all depending on your operations. But make sure that when the drivers know ahead of time and it's spelled out and written out, it's much easier than having to have them guess and figure this out. So again, going to the next one, setting those expectations for your drivers um, on the personal conveyance of yard moves and on reviewing their logs, editing their logs, and submitting their logs. As soon as said, Federal Motor Carrier puts the onus on the drivers to make sure that that final log that's submitted has their approval on it. So, and you can't in the back office with an ELD suggest an edit to that log unless it's been certified. So the drivers are going to have to review, edit, and make sure when they submit those logs that they are accurate um, and that they're approving that. Um, and if they're not, and if they're not keeping up with that, have a company policy on that where you have progressive disciplinary action and you're following through with that. It's going to make it a lot easier for you guys in the back office as well. Um, develop, again, policies for login and log out for all staff. As soon as that vehicle hits five miles an hour, you're going to start calculating unassigned drive events, which hopefully we'll explain in a later uh, webinar that we'll be having come up soon. Um, but make sure that you have a policy for that. Who can use those logins, um, you know, how those are assigned and whatnot. So again, new company policies, and it's a good time to review and to update those old ones. And uh, going into the age of technology here, make sure that you're protecting yourself um, for an audit or for litigation if that happens to come up. 
Number four, training. Training, training, training. So soon am I going out there, I cannot impress upon you the importance of training the drivers and everybody that's written on here. Drivers, mechanics, dispatchers, your fleet managers, safety managers, human resources. They all need to know what's going on. They all need to know how this back office system works. Um, drivers out on the road when they have problems, they need to know who to go to. You don't want to send them just to anybody. Um, you know, people in your office need to know how these devices work, what they do, how they can help the drivers when the drivers have problems. The mechanics. If your mechanics are moving those trucks around, they need to know that as soon as it hit five miles an hour, it's going to log an unidentified event, which if it does that, your back office fleet manager, safety folks, dispatchers, and the drivers are going to have to deal with that. So they need to be trained on when to log in, when to log out, and if they're an ELD exempt driver and yard moves, all that type of stuff. So your mechanics need to get involved here. Um, the dispatchers, you can look at you know, how many hours that the drivers have left. You can see if there's any violations. Fleet managers and safety managers, using ELDs to have full visibility of your fleet is wonderful. It is golden. Um, but if they don't know how the system works and they don't know what they're looking at, um, it's kind of a little bit of a waste. So it, it's gold to have that visibility, to have that data. So the more you train them on what they're looking at and how to use it, can increase your ROI and it also can increase your safety, which is the name of the game and why we're doing all this. So make sure that you're training, make sure that you have those policies implemented on when you're training and writing that down, it will help you in the long run. And it'll help what we're seeing the better trained and the more time carriers are taking to do their training, the more successful they are and the quicker they're making the transition with their onboarding. And number five, we have one more here that we're going to go through. Work with your ELD provider. This is a relationship, folks. I mean, these, these contracts are you know anywhere from one to three years, could be more than that. So this is a relationship that you're embarking upon with a technology provider. Um, read through the user manuals that Suna was talking about that is uh, uh, on that registry. can tell a lot about the device and about the company, uh, the quality of those user manuals. And some of them on there, you could go through the user your manuals and see that they're actually not compliant with the ELD mandate. So read those user manuals. Um, look at the training materials that the, the ELD provider um, has on their website, has available for your drivers and for all those folks on the previous slide. Um, it'll give you a good idea for you know, what you might need to be backfilling or they might have all of the information and training materials ready. Um, we have an ELD Train the Trainer PowerPoint that we have available on our website that's, that you know, carriers can use as is or they can um, customize it. Um, and other carriers have, or other providers have similar things, and some providers don't have any training guidance or materials at all. Or they may charge you for that. So it's good to look into that and see what's available, because the more help you have, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. It's already there, and it already is there for you. It can save you some time and some money. So roadside inspections and malfunction and data diagnostic, those visor cards that Suna was talking about that have to be um, in the vehicle with the drivers, you know, the quality of those is going to help roadside inspectors be able to do a quick inspection. So look at that. Check out what those look like. If you can't figure it out, I guarantee you roadside is going to be confused as well. Um, look at the customer and technical support. So ELD providers that you're looking at, call up their technical support. Call up their customer service. Ask them a few questions. Um, see if they have like a safety and compliance specialist manager on, on staff like we have SUNY here for E-Road. Um, but because, you know, that's who you're going to be calling in the next couple of years when you have problems. And know ahead of time where to go, how to get help on those technical issues or compliance questions. Like Suna said, you have eight days um, if something goes down and your unit's not working that you need to figure out how to get that fixed. So laying that all ahead of time, you're going to need to work with your ELD provider. So make sure that they are someone that you want to have a good relationship with. And I think, I think we're going on here and uh, passing it back off to, to Suna here. And um, I think we have some questions that have come through. <coughs> and and what, so what do we have coming through so far? All right. So we have a few questions from the crowd here. Um, the first one is about 
Uh, we had an email from the California Trucking Association. The deadline for intrastate adoption is February of 2019 in California, um, and that could change since CHP could implement it before that date. Can you give some clarification on intrastate operators? A great question, actually. Um, so in terms of where they send, so there's FMCSR that allows three years for the adoption uh, by each state for the intrastate, uh, which means it's February 2019 when each of the states will go through and um, make that adoption for the intrastate carriers. So for the CHP, um, they have until that time, you know, February of 2019 to um, adopt and the mandate for ELDs for the intrastate carriers um, into the code of uh, regulations there. Uh, we understand it may be closer to mid-late 2018 when they go through this adoption, um, but until that time, it's, it's not clear for the intrastate as to when that time frame will be for um, implementation. You know, um, looking at each of the inter intrastate carriers, um, in each of the states, if you are an intrastate carrier, um, it's upon the states to go through the adoption individually. They could be uh, one of these options. They could be an auto-adopt state, which means they take the federal mandate as is, or they may choose to go through a legislative process and have a separate adoption, um, and they may amend or change any of those dates. Or it may be that you know they uh, take it, but then they amend a lot of it um, through the you know their own uh, regulatory process. So um, what we would suggest is if, if you are an intrastate carrier, then please check in with each of your state DOTs to find out where they are in that process and what the date will be for your the adoption. Great, uh, and we have another question. Does an ELD have to be hardware hardwired to the engine? Does an OBD2 port in a vehicle count as being hardwired to the engine? Great question there too. Um, in terms of the ELD, the mandate requires that it has to be connected to the ECM. Now it could it's likely to be hardwired through a device. Now that device could be the so single device that you use, which is the case for Everd, where it's the single device that connects to the ECM, or you could have a device that connects through to the in, to the ECM, which is then Bluetooth connected with your let's say tablet or a mobile phone, which is what Susan described as the BYOD model. So it depends on how the architecture for the ELD provider has set with. Um, they could have it in different models with the different devices. But just be aware that you know if it is um, going through multiple devices, you know, and using Bluetooth as the primary connection between those, um, uh, the device that connects to the engine versus the device that the driver interacts with, that um, that connection is strong enough to withstand, you know, the different situations the driver may face, like the roadside inspection, or as they are driving, that the connection doesn't drop off. So those things need to be um, things that you consider when you are um, making that decision for an ELD. And we have another question here. Uh, how can I find out if my existing AOBRD can be upgraded to an ELD? Good question. Uh, in terms of the AOBRDs, um, our recommendation is make sure that you check that FMCSA registry, which is publicly available to you. Um, we provided that link on our presentation. When you do go on there, um, you need to make sure not only is that provider on the registry, but the particular device that you are using needs to be the one that is on the registry as well. If not, then that, that particular device, which is the AOBRD, is not going to be an ELD for you going past that compliance date. So um, it prompts a question for that ELD vendor that you're using or the AOBRD vendor that you're using, whether they that particular device you're using right now um, will become an ELD and be a, appearing on that registry. So, And make sure you, you, you just reach out to, if you're not sure, reach out to your current AOBRD provider, ask them, you know, when or if there's going to be a hardware or firmware change out required and if there's a cost associated with that, they should be able to help you with that. All right, and I had another question here. Is your ELD an in-cab solution or a bring-your-own device? Uh, 
Yes, so EL, uh, Evo DLD is an in-cab device. It connects to the hardwire. Uh, it's hardwired and connected to the engine, but it's also that single device that the driver interacts with. So we've ch chosen to go with the tethered solution. It keeps the driver connected at all times and m ensures that it's not um, going to drop off that connection. Great. And if I'm using an AOBRD into next year and I add trucks, is it possible for all of my drivers to all be on one system? In other words, do the ELDs talk to the AOBRD systems? Interesting question. So um, it's, again, um, something that you need to talk to the AOBRD provider about in terms of whether it, is the whether it will be compatible with the ELD solution that um, your drivers will also be using. Sometimes it may not, in which case um, you may face an operational challenge. Um, so just be aware that um, what you have, um, if you're choosing an AOBRD and you are also selecting an ELD, that if they, if they are compatible and whether your drivers are going to be interacting with both, that um, it's not going to create compliance issues or that it's going to be administratively, um, it's not going to be administratively challenging to manage those um, switch between the two. So. And uh, we have another question here. Thank you all for uh, putting in your questions. If you have more, we'll continue for another few minutes. This question is, what are you hearing uh, from the industry about the ELD delay? That's an excellent question. We've heard a lot of um, noise um, for a couple of months now um, in terms of what's going through the Congress. Um, you know, uh, Susan and I were recently at the um, uh, CVSA conference, um, and we heard uh, from FMCSA as well as the American Trucking Association um, uh, on this point. Um, so FMCSA, in the way that they were communicating with the inspectors and training them, uh, they were actually um, all uh, ready to go. Um, we're all in preparation mode for the compliance date. Um, they were saying that it's unlikely for Congress to pass that um, and for it to go through. So, um, you know, just be aware that um, what you hear in the media, um, it's only as a part of um, what's going on. There's a lot of steps uh, and a lot of um, different stakeholders that are actually involved in this. Um, ATA and your state trucking associations are what um, they're going, uh, what are uh, influencing this process um, and I think you know from what we hear from the industry there's strong advocacy efforts there um, that is like that means it's unlikely to proceed you know FMC is preparing for the compliance state and you know um, I think it's worthwhile for the carriers to also be preparing um, for this as well so great thank you so much Suna um, well, we, it looks like we are just about out of time here. Uh, did you two have any more comments? No, I just wanted to thank you all for taking the time today to attend the webinar. Um, it does take a village to understand this stuff, and, and Suna and I are very fortunate that we, you know, this is our job. This is what we get to do. Um, but going out there, we're finding there's, there's multiple different levels of understanding of the mandate right now. So please, our, our contact information will be on the next slide here. Reach out to us. Um, as resources, um, we can get you answers, and if we, if we don't have an answer for something, which there's a lot of answers we don't know because it is quite confusing sometimes, we'll find the people because we do have a lot of um, high tax high up with FMCSA and ATA that um, we'll get an answer for you. So please reach out, use us, use us as resources, and um, we're here for you. So um, uh, thank you for attending, and thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. Yes, thank you all for your questions. If we didn't get to yours during the session, we will follow up with you personally. Again, as a reminder, we will send an email with the slides and the recording. We will also be including an eRoad red paper that covers this topic, so you can share it with colleagues who may also want additional information. Uh, big thank you to our presenters, Susan and Suna, for their valuable information on ELD versus AOBRD. Here at eRoad, we believe in educating our customers. We are highly active in the industry and attend numerous events across the country each year. Please check our website, eRoad.com, for events that we may be attending near you. We love getting involved in both local and national events to make sure that we're getting information at all levels so that we can bring that intel back to both our product team and our customers. We're continually using that knowledge to improve our product to better meet our customers' needs. 
eRoad offers a complete suite of user-friendly fleet management, compliance, and driver safety solutions, including our FMCSA registered and third-party verified ELD. Our all-in-one solution provides electronic tax, fuel, and fleet utilization reporting, as well as vehicle maintenance and driver safety tools. Uh, if you'd like a demo, please contact the number on our screen or email us personally with any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you again to all that attended and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.